Hey, hey, welcome to Advancing AI, where we talk all things AI and machine learning. Today, we're going to be talking about the second part of the GraphRag series. It's all about how you set up the environment and different options in terms of GraphRag architectures. Now, we're going to do this in 10 minutes. So without further delay, we're going to have Chris back and we're going to be talking about how you set up the environment and the different options you have in terms of implementing GraphRag. Thanks, Gary. Let's dive straight into these slides then. So in episode two, let's just go through a quick agenda. We're going to try and give you a quick recap of what we spoke about in episode one. We're going to break down our components so we understand the core components that are actually included within the GraphRag implementation. And then we're going to take those components and look at the different high-level architectures we could, we could look at. And that's looking at Llama Index, that's looking at MS GraphRag, and that's looking at Langchain implementations. And there's a bonus slide at the end where we would look to move our Langchain implementation into the cloud and how that would look in production. Fantastic. Cool. Let's dive straight into it. So a quick recap of what a knowledge graph is. So you've got a bunch of nodes and you've got a bunch of connections. The interconnectedness of these nodes allows us to traverse the graph and and extract from it context or knowledge for our RAG implementation. Let's just briefly talk about how large language models are actually used within the graph RAG implementation um, and the different points that they're encountered. So coming from the left side, we have a document store and we go through a document ingestion and I'm sure you're well aware of what document crafting is, but it's extracting strings or text from yep. PDFs or any document. We chunk that document yep. and then we look to embed it. Yep. Now, Another word for document cracking is document chunking, right, Chris? So yep. it's used interchangeably as well, cracking, chunking. But it's all about taking a document and splitting it up to smaller, more digestible sections yeah. or downstream. Yeah. Both, both for context and processing. So if you break it into, let's say, headers, you yep. can then have a little paragraph that's just one section, but it also means that the large language model that's embedding that can do it quicker than having one whole document to process. Yeah. So at that point, where, we, where we've got that chunk and that context, we want to pass that over the first time to the large language model. And yeah. you can see it comes back up to embeddings, and we embed it into the knowledge graph. And there, we can return the context. OK, I've got a question there. So when we're yeah. doing the embeddings within the knowledge graph, this is very different yeah. to how you'd embed a document that's been chunked into a vector database. Are we yeah. embedding just the entities or the entities and nodes here, Chris? Both, both entities and nodes. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, and there's also a couple of different ways depending on your implementation. And we'll go nice. into that later. So okay. if you're doing an, a line chain implementation, you have the option to both embed the entities and nodes and vectors, and then you can perform a hybrid search, Ooh, which is- you know, if you're used to um, AI search, you, yeah. you're well aware of what a hybrid search is. Cool. So we've at this point, we've embedded the vectors or the entities and nodes into our knowledge graph. And we're going to go, we're going to take that context and we're going to do a little bit of prompt and, and oh, sorry, we're going to do a little bit of prompt engineering and pass that on to our large, lang large language model, where we yeah. both have the prompt and context and return it to the user. Cool. So now we've got a good idea of how large language models are used within this process. Let's move on to the different graph databases that could be used. And there are quite a few. Um, depending on the size or how you view this, Neo4j is probably the biggest. Yeah. Uh, a good mention for Nebula, Nebula Graph. Um, they have a good integration with Llama Index. Yeah. Any questions before we move on to no. the different large language model providers? So I'm sure you're well aware of the different large language providers that there are. Um, there is Azure OpenAI, uh, OpenAI, OpenAI, Google Cloud, Hugging Face, AWS. Um, the list is ever changing every single day. Yeah. Um, you pick your preferred. There are some limitations depending on your choice of library that you use to implement GraphRag. Um, for instance, the MS Graph RAG is only applicable to Azure OpenAI and OpenAI. So that is a limitation. Um, before we move on, any clarification needed? No, that's good. Ooh, this is a overview of the of a local implementation of MS Graph RAG. Um, on the bottom left-hand side, we have 
kind of relating back to our process flow. We're ingesting documents into our local environment where the where they're in where an indexing job will go off and it will pick up those documents it will then embed those documents via open ai embedding so you know your text aders o2s that kind of thing return those vectors and store those vectors within park within parquet in your local machine you do have an option to store them as csvs and a couple other formats that i can't remember off the top of my head but parquet and csv are the two main one there um, it will store it locally and then there is another Another query, sorry, another function that MS Graph Rank does, which queries those parquets and it sends those that context out to OpenAI and it will then return the responses back to your local environment in the command line. Um, you can do it via a notebook as well. And in a later episode, we'll go through a demo of that notebook. Llama index. So the next two slides for local Llama index and local Langchain aren't going to be vastly different. Um, Llama index gives you a little bit more flexibility. It's a little bit more for advanced users than Langchain is. Um, and uh, in terms of the process, it's, it's not too massively different. So I've referred to the context that we're extracting from the documents into vectors because it's quite normal terminology for chunks we're extracting out of documents and storing into a database. Um, though they're not necessarily vectors, they may be nodes and entities or vectors depending which database you're going to, they're, they're kind of interchangeable. The process is still the same. Um, so the Llama index, if we're hosting that in a notebook or a Python script or a stream app, it's going to sit on your local machine. You're going to embed via any embedding model with this. So you can yeah. change it to a Databricks endpoint or a hugging face endpoint, much yes. more flexibility than MS Graph Rag. Yeah. We then go store that within a graph database and we then return the embeddings if we're performing a search. Yeah. Um, we take those embeddings or context to over to your large language model endpoint. Again, with Llama index or and Langchain, there's a little bit more flexibility here. You can have a hugging face endpoint or yeah. a cloud, a Google Cloud endpoint. We return the response, and then we return that response to the user. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Let's move on to Langchain. As I said, there's not much difference here. Yeah. Um, other than for this specific implementation, we're going to talk specifically about Aurora DB and yeah. how that's being used. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm going to walk through this. It's it's pretty yeah. much exactly the same. I think we should move on to how would we put that Langchain model into a production environment? Cool. So let's delve into how we move that Langchain local implementation into the cloud and the different components. Let's start with the embeddings function and how we would do that. So the embeddings function is held within an, within an Azure function, um, within an uh, sorry, it's held within a function within an Azure functions. So yeah. we've got a serverless um, endpoint that we can do batched embeddings from. That batched embeddings collects the documents from a blob storage. It then sends those chunked documents. So the Langchain Azure function will handle the chunking of the documents. It will then send the chunks out to an Azure OpenAI endpoint. Or yeah. and for general purposes, we've got a Databricks or Azure OpenAI endpoint. And they could be any type of model that you want to send to. Um, specifically, let's say you had VGE re-ranker and or any hug and face model that was held within an ML, ML flow endpoint, you could send them to those via the open gateway. Now we've put open gateway there for a specific reason to do low balancing and disaster recovery. Um, brilliant for production environments. Yep. Once we've returned those chunk, well, once we've returned those vectors, we would then send out those vectors via open gateway to an Aurora DB. Yep. And then that's kind of the embedding function and how that looks. Now let's move on to how we leverage this. So starting from the right, oddly, the end user would click a button that would send their prompt to the front end. Yep. That prompt would get sent to another Azure function that held the graph rag implementation. But before it goes out to APIM, it would go and check in Cosmos DB for any cache responses, just in case we can make this faster and yep. cheaper to handle. It would then go along that top line of returning those responses to the end user if we did have a cache response. If we didn't, it would then go out to APM Gateway that would then search within Aurora DB for the context we're looking for. It would then return back to the Azure function. It would return that context back. And we would go out to another Databricks endpoint or an open AI endpoint 
to actually form our final response. Once we formed our final response, we would go back along that top line of returning the response to the end user. Brilliant, I mean, that is very comprehensive. Thank you very much, Chris. No worries. Any questions on that before we finish the no, episode? Gary? That's brilliant. So I guess that brings us to the end of episode two. Now, uh, what, what, what do we have in store for episode three, Chris? Episode three is going to be doing a demo of that local lang chain implementation. So we'll look at how the different components that we talked about in this episode come together in a notebook, and we can then embed and ask some questions of some documents. Brilliant. All right, thank you very much, Chris. I look forward to the next episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and see you soon. See ya. Bye.